Hey guys, it's JM here with another episode of Pages from Sages. And this episode, we're going to look at the writings by one of the world's uh, most famous atheists. This is um, from a book that came out in 2007. This is by Anthony Flew, who was one of the most famous atheists of the 20th century. I think he debated C.S. Lewis and wrote prolifically in defense of atheism, British philosopher. And he, in 2007, this book came out, he died shortly thereafter. And over the course of his life, uh, he ended up moving from his position of atheism to, in the end, before he died at least, a sense of general theism, uh, a sense of a belief in a creator God. He never, as far as we know, became a Christian, never professed belief in the Christian God. But his, um, his life was spent, uh, he says in the book, searching for truth. And according to what he writes, it was the arguments from um, cosmology. It was the scientific and the philosophical arguments of, of time and the universe and fine-tuning and creation and all of these things, Big Bang cosmology, that led him ultimately to conclude that atheism was a poorer explanation for how the universe came to be than was the idea of a creator, of, of theism. That's about as close as he ever got, it's as most specific as he ever got, as far as we know. But it's fascinating because rarely do you have someone who's literally a giant in their field, uh, through their continued studies in that field, come to embrace a diametrically opposed point of view that they used to argue against so much. And this book is, I wanted to share a couple of insights from it because they were, I liked what he said uh, at the beginning of the book when he's talking about uh, why he wrote this book now. And he says, I suppose many of us, as we age, look back on our youth with a mixture of nostalgia and embarrassment. I'm sure these emotions are quite common. However, not all of us have the added misfortune of having recorded and published, no less, some of those embarrassments. But such is my case. That's pretty honest and uh, interesting to hear somebody admit that. You, you don't hear that a lot in, in the publishing world, the academic world, the literary world, the philosophical world, where everything is, is almost like this game of one-upsmanship or, or trying to win an argument rather than seek truth. And so this book was, a, it's, it's re was refreshing to read someone actually chronicling their uh, journey in seeking truth and how it led to something that, that somewhere that they didn't really want it to lead. It's actually his, his former contemporary, C.S. Lewis, that's his story as well, how he ended up becoming a Christian. Their paths were uh, different in terms of where they ended up, but they were the same in terms of their starting point. What is true and let me follow that to where it leads no matter what and be brave enough to embrace the consequences. And no, it doesn't matter what our beliefs are, Christian, atheist, Buddhist, Hindu, Muslim, uh, we should all be seeking saying, hey, I wanna know what's true, and if I'm convinced that something's true, then I need to take that truth to its logical conclusion and not be afraid uh, to go where the facts point or where the arguments lead. And that's something that not everyone's able to do, but Flu was in this book. And he, there's a lot of interesting insights in it, but one of the things he makes a point of, uh, he says, I'm going to read a paragraph, this is from page 41. He says, the attempt to show that there is no philosophical knowledge by simply urging that there is always someone who can be relied on to remain unconvinced is a common fallacy made even by a distinguished philosopher like Bertrand Russell. I call it the, but there is always someone who will never agree diversion. What he's saying is, you know, in, in philosophical circles, you can always come up with a, but somebody will disagree with this. You know, there's always a reason that you could give for, okay, what you're saying makes sense, and I grant all of these premises, but I don't want to accept it, so I'm sure there's somebody somewhere that would disagree, and then you try to come up with that, and then as if that's an argument against it. And it's, uh, he notes that that's not the case, that, that's, that may be how some things in technical philosophy work, but in terms of everyday life, that's not how we make our decisions. And he goes on to say, then there is the charge that in philosophy it's never possible to prove to someone that you're right and he or she is wrong. But the missing piece in this argument is the distinction between producing a proof and persuading a person. A person can be persuaded by an abominable argument 
and remain unconvinced by one that ought to be accepted. And that's such an interesting point that deserves uh, contemplation by anyone on any subject, whether we're arguing politics, religion, um, you know, what is the best movie of all time, or any of these other things that we, the answer is big trouble in little China, by the way. Um, but any of these things that we have arguments over, it's, we have to realize, you know, we can't, there, there's going to be a, a point at which proof in the mathematical, scientific sense of the word becomes impossible. Um, you, you, if you're determined to not believe something, then you can come up with, through enough ingenuity, a reason not to believe it. And so what I like about what Fu is saying is, look, we need to make a distinction. There's difference. Mathematical proof, you know, scientific proof, precision, proving something beyond any doubt is very rare. And it can happen in math, and there's a few areas that it can happen uh, outside of that. But, it, but it's a rare thing to absolutely prove something beyond any doubt to anyone at any time. And that's not what we seek. You know, when we're trying to engage somebody on a discussion, we're not seeking, at least we shouldn't be seeking, to prove anything. What we should be seeking is to persuade of the point of view that we hold. Because that's what's going to change people's minds. That's what's going to carry the day is not what can you prove, but what can you be persuaded to embrace. And it's a double-edged sword because it, it means that you don't have to have like this infallible proof in order to get someone to listen and to accept what you're saying and to believe it and to act on it. Whether again, whether we're talking religion, whether we're talking politics, ethics, anything. But it's also, like I said, a double-edged sword because, man, people just believe some really dumb stuff based on some really poor arguments. And that is not uh, limited to one particular philosophy or belief system. Some of the dumbest arguments I've ever heard in my life have come from people who claim that they are free thinkers or that they're bright or that they're, you know, rational. And I listen to what they say. I'm like, that's... You're not even remotely any of those things if this is your argument. And of course, likewise, people that are theists, you know, I've heard some terrible arguments coming from uh, Christians or Muslims or uh, any number of views. So I like this. I liked it. Well, I like the book because it was interesting. It was refreshing to read it. But I also liked what he points out along the way and the difference, again, between being persuasive versus having to prove something. And in the end, you know, I I don't know. Uh, Anthony flew his eternal destiny. I mean, I'm a Christian. I believe that's in the Lord's hands. I don't have any reason to think he never gave any reason to think that he uh, embraced God as his as his savior. And so, theologically, do with that what you will. But this book is worth discussing, and it was worth covering and sharing with you guys because of just how different it was than what you read every day, and how rare it is to see this if someone of this magnitude in terms of a publishing career. So um, check it out if you're interested. There is a God. Anthony Flew, the world's most notorious atheist, changed his mind. And share your own comments. Uh, if you've read the book, share anything that you liked, anything you disliked in the comment section below. And subscribe to this video series if you haven't already on YouTube. And that's it. We'll see you next time.